and since I regard uh, Rothbard's welfare theory as the most comprehensive and well-developed uh, Austrian tool for tackling the issue of collective goods, I would like to devote this presentation to some nuances and uh, criticisms of it. So what's the starting premise of the theory? The starting premise, which is also one of the basic insights of subjectivist economics, is that no interpersonal comparisons of utility can be made because utility is a subjective psychological magnitude and there is no physical, spatially extended uh, yardstick or benchmark against which uh, it can be measured. But ordinal, intrapersonal comparisons of utility can be made. We do it all the time, and human action is precisely about substituting a more desirable state of affairs for a less desirable state of affairs, which uh, every such substitution requires making an intrapersonal, ordinal comparison of utility. In every voluntary transaction, both parties to the transaction make such a comparison and act on its basis, and therefore demonstrating that they prefer the post-transaction state to the pre-transaction state. And in this sense, every voluntary transaction is Pareto superior and results in what the Austrians call the plain state of rest, which is one of the realistic equilibrium constructs. So... Thus we get the first theorem of Rothbard's welfare economics, which is that every voluntary transaction can be objectively said to increase social utility. On the other hand, in a coerced transaction, the coercer gains, he demonstrates that he prefers the post-coercion state to the pre-coercion state, but uh, it cannot be claimed that the coerced gains because subjecting him uh, to coercion, by definition, prevents him from uh, demonstrating his preferences. So we cannot say that he, that the coerced, gains. And uh, that's how we arrive at uh, the second theorem of Rothbard's welfare economics, which is that government interventions or any coercive interferences cannot be said to increase social utility. And uh, a final implication that follows from that is that uh, the notion of a positive externality becomes uh, speculative, purely speculative and psychologistic, and therefore economically unoperationalizable, uh, whereas the notion of negative externality can really be reduced to, to the violation of property titles, really. So that's Rothbard's theory in a nutshell. Now uh, let me proceed to some criticisms of it. The first criticism that I have uh, tackled says that uh, it cannot really be claimed that, uh, uh, that every government intervention decreases social utility. At most, it can be claimed, if someone works within Rothbard's analytical framework, that uh, we do not know the efficiency of government interventions or other coercive interferences. And uh, the critics say that uh, this makes the Rothbardian efficiency case for a less affair much weaker than usually supposed. For instance, it doesn't allow us to say that uh, communism is ineffective, for example. At most, uh, it allows us to say that uh, we do not know how effective communism is. But I think that this criticism rests on a misunderstanding of what uh, Pareto inferiority means. Pareto inferior scenarios are precisely the ones in which we do not know the extent to which social utility increased or decreased. Not the ones in which we unambiguously and objectively know that it decreased. Because notice, as long as we, as scientific economists, confine ourselves to the study and analysis of demonstrated preferences, w in order to observe an unambiguous drop in social utility, we would have to observe a transaction or an interaction in which both parties act so as to decrease their utility. And this is praxeologically impossible, because every action is aimed at increasing the utility of the agent. So at most what qualifies for a Pareto inferior situation is a coercive situation in which one party gains and the other party loses. That's all we need 
to observe in order to conclude that the situation or the interaction is Pareto inferior. And in this sense, communism is maximally ineffective uh, in the sense that under communism most or all social interactions are coerced and that is why under communism no increases in social utility takes place. We can, you do not observe any. On the other hand, under, uh, let us say, anarcho-capitalism, every social transaction would be said, could be said to increase social utility because under anarcho-capitalism every social interaction is a voluntary exchange of legitimate property titles. And this makes every such interaction mutually beneficial. So, in order to make all of this clearer and uh, more easily visualizable, I would like to provide you with a simple graphical representation of what I take to be the crucial difference between those two kinds of transactions. So, So that's a voluntary transaction. It's a plus since it's a positive sum game. Both parties gain and that's basically the rest of the world. One huge area of indeterminacy which includes uh, all sorts of sentiments expressed, exposed by third parties and bystanders, their verbal declarations, their possible envy and so on. We cannot say anything about that. So we can see that social utility increased. We do not know to what extent, but it did increase. Now let's go to a coerced transaction. Here again, there is a plus. The coercer gains. There is a minus. The coerced loses. And again, we cannot say anything about the rest of the world. But... The crucial point is that since interpersonal comparisons of utility cannot be made, those two reduce to indeterminacy. We cannot say whether social utility increased overall and decreased overall. So the final outcome of a coerced transaction is indeterminacy. The final outcome of a voluntary transaction is at least one plus, at least one positive sum game. So that's, I think, the crucial difference which shows that uh, the former is Pareto superior, the latter is Pareto inferior. So that uh, gets the first criticism out of the way. Now let's go to the second criticism. The second criticism says that the coerced cannot, by definition, demonstrate by their actions that they prefer not being coerced. So the critic would say, this minus over here should really be another X. It's indeterminate. If someone is coerced and rend rendered passive by coercion, then we cannot say anything about his utility. And then the situation here would become strictly parallel to the situation here, because here the voluntarily transacting parties would gain, here the coercer gains, and we cannot say anything about the rest in both of these cases. So that's that's what the second criticism says. And I think that uh, two points can be made here. First, it could be said that the coerced do demonstrate that uh, they prefer not being coerced. Think about uh, them engaging in such activities as tax evasion, the use of tax havens, uh, looking for loopholes in the tax law, uh, going underground, joining the black markets or the grey markets, and so on. But uh, it seems to me that there is an obvious counter-argument to be made here, which says that here we are comparing two systematic regular processes which uh, take place over time. On the one hand, systematic coercion. On the other hand, systematic uh, attempts to avoid that coercion. And it seems that this involves making uh, intertemporal comparisons of utility, which would be as unwarranted as making interpersonal comparisons of utility. Because 
intertemporal, making intertemporal comparisons of utility here would uh, involve making an unwarranted assumption that uh, the preference rankings of the involved parties are constant over time in order to avoid any mismatch, temporal mismatch. And uh, Rothbard's welfare theory can be said to avoid making that assumption precisely by focusing on specific moments when transactions take place. So uh, in order to defend his uh, second welfare theorem, it would need to be shown that uh, the coerced suffer a utility loss precisely at the moment in which he is coerced. Not before that, not after that. So maybe all those uh, activities that I mentioned earlier do not really apply here because they refer to different temporal points. So, but I think that there is a better answer to be given to the critic here, which is to say the following, or to realize the following. As long as the owner of the property title X doesn't trade X for something else or give it away, he implicitly demonstrates that he prefers keeping it. So by coercively appropriating X, the coercer can be objectively shown to frustrate the original owner's preferences. Because if the original owner were willing to part with X uh, on his own, there would be no need for coercion. The coercer could simply ask, can I appropriate X? And the owner would consent. So I think what I said boils down to the fact that non-action or what seems to be a non-action with respect to one's property implicitly presupposes that one prefers to keep one's property rather than to give it away. Even if one doesn't actively use it at any given moment, the fact that he doesn't trade it for something else demonstrates implicitly that he prefers to keep it. And in this sense, we can say that coercion, by forcibly taking it away, by laying a non-consensual claim on someone's property, frustrates the original owner's preferences. So this is my answer to the second criticism. And uh, thirdly and lastly, the third criticism, which says that... Uh, even though undertaking a certain action demonstrates that the agent prefers a given outcome to all of the available alternatives, um, it doesn't follow from that that as a result of acting in such a manner, his utility increases overall. And uh, let me give you an illustrative example here. Imagine that uh, a cartel is formed... Uh, for the sake of the argument, let us suppose that a voluntary cartel is uh, formed on the market. The consumers, even if they continue to patronize the cartel and buy goods from it, by which they demonstrate that they prefer buying those goods than not buying them, they still can be said to lose overall, right? Because they were better off before the cartel emerged than after the cartel emerged. That's the criticism. So even though, again, we have voluntary transactions in place, it cannot be said unambiguously that uh, the result is increased social welfare. And I think that uh, an appropriate reply here is the following. Rothbard's welfare theory says only that uh, every voluntary transaction is uh, Pareto superior within given uh, momentary background conditions, right, which are brought about by the preceding interpersonal interactions. That's what is sometimes called the regression theorem of social interactions. But uh, what Rothbard's theory doesn't say is that uh, those preceding transactions cannot impose some sort of a psychological cost on a given person or alter his preferent rank, preference ranking or anything like that. So it cannot be guaranteed that, uh, psychologically speaking, uh, I will find the conditions prevailing at time t more favorable than the conditions that prevailed at time uh, t minus 1, for example. But uh, as long as I am permitted to act freely at both of those temporal points, 
my actions can still be said to be Pareto superior. So the crucial point here is that at each of those points I prefer acting in a specific manner to not acting in that manner. So I would lose if I were coercively held passive. And that's all that's important from the point of view of Rothbard's theory. It doesn't claim that all sorts of changing background conditions, changing from one temporal point to another temporal point, cannot impose some additional psychological costs on any given agent. So uh, this cartel example that I mentioned earlier is uh, really not a valid criticism of Rothbard's theory. Okay, so that concludes the list of criticisms that I wanted to mention, which leads me to the final conclusion that Rothbard's welfare theory is more robust and well thought of, well thought out than many of its critics suppose. Thank you. <laughs>